Okay. Hello, welcome to the lecture Aspects of Algebraic Number Theory. Um, I will tell you a bit of, of about what we will do in the lecture, what um, organizational things, exercise sheets, how the rhythm uh, with the exercises will be, when will you have to hand that in, what are the prerequisites uh, that you need to know for the, for the lecture, what kind of books could you need uh, for, for the lecture. And the first thing is maybe, um, do you want to have a break in the middle or should we just have the lecture um, one and a half hours without the break? Who wants a break? Who doesn't want the break? Hmm. And the other people are without an opinion. Then I would say we take a break. Okay, so um, there was already an exercise lesson on Monday. I don't know how many of you attended there. Um, we agreed now that you can hand in the exercise sheets in pairs and um, we said that you, ha what did we say when do, do they ha have to hand it in? Ah, uh, yeah, before the lecture. So Wednesday uh, evening, so that you have your mind free for the lecture, right. And on Thursdays, um, we will th uh, think about the next exercise sheet and put it probably online uh, on Friday. So you have the weekend to think about it, and then you can talk about it on Mondays, and you can work together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and hand it in on Wednesdays. Um, I actually, so my usual, my, my plan in the beginning was to have the lecture um, as uh, an inverted classroom style lecture. So I record the lessons and put them online, but COVID uh, didn't allow me to because I had COVID, then my children had COVID, then other children had COVID, and then uh, the semester break was over and I hadn't recorded the lectures. So this is the second best thing to this. I will record the lectures. You can either be here and watch them uh, live or you can um, watch them at home later. Um, so I will try to put them online on Thursdays evenings. I hope everything works out. Last semester I had some problems with um, finding the files. Um, yeah, the exam. So in the module handbook, it says either written or oral exam. I don't know if I decide this or someone else decides this or we decide it together. And I also don't know when the exam will be. I don't know when they will announce when it will be. Maybe any of you <laughs> has a clue how that works, yeah? Okay, and the written exam? Yeah, okay. And but are there slots for the written exams probably? Do you know that? Yeah. So so I would suggest that we wait a few weeks and see how many people will uh, stay in this lecture because uh, I think there are like 25 or 30 people registered and if all those people stay, I will not do an oral exam. But if it's maybe 10 or 15 in the end, we can decide what we want. But I think it has to be uh, the same for everyone. So we cannot do an oral exam for five people and a written exam for the rest. Um, yeah. The prerequisites for this lecture is, uh, as I already wrote online, basically nothing, I hope. But it's good if you know what a number field is. It's um, amazing if you know uh, what a ring of integers of a number field is. Um, but I think if we need this, we only need it for imaginary quadratic fields. And I think when we need it will be like in January. And then we only need a bit of superficial knowledge about it and not very deep knowledge. So people who have not attended Victoria's lecture a year ago are still very welcome here and they will still be able to follow everything, I think. 
because my goal is um, they're kind of the, um, the the small title for this lecture will be elliptic curves hands-on. So we will talk about elliptic curves and we will not even, even though this is theoretical mathematics, we will not talk about um, much background. We will, of course, we will prove things and we will also have some theory, but we really want to work with the elliptic curves and touch them and feel them and get some intuition about them. So um, there are two books that are um, very helpful for this um, lecture. Ooh. Ah, it's, it stops when I, okay. <coughs> First is Silverman Tate. Rational points on elliptic curves. And the other one is Silverman. The arithmetic of elliptic curves. Uh, my plan was also to write um, lecture notes in LaTeX and give them to you, but this also didn't work out. So I will um, use this book kind of almost as lecture notes. And I will um, keep track of which pages I, um, uh, I treated in the lecture and tell you which pages are important. And who doesn't know this side, it's uh, the side that you should bookmark. It's um, uh, where people uploaded books and uh, papers, and you can find both of those books there. Lib Gen Library Genesis. Well, it's, it's probably not as illegal as downloading movies. Um, but of course, uh, Springer doesn't like this website. <laughs> but it exists, and it hasn't been sued. And it exists, well, since I started with math, this page exists. I don't know. And it's all over. If you Google it, then you see YouTube videos, how to download a book from LibGen. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> <coughs> of course, you can also buy those books, but I think this costs like 50 euros and this costs like 80 euros. So this uh, doesn't make sense. What I'm asking if I get sued, can I the. No, no, definitely not. And probably you should also um, have an antivirus program when you use it, but. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like I think I will probably use 90% of the time this book and 10% of the time this book and this book is more like um, it's kind of it's not really like a, a usual math book it's more like it tells you the story of the elliptic curves and it's it uses much many words and this is more like definition, proposition, theorem, lemma, corollary. And so I will use this when we have some, yeah, hard definitions that are not very explicit in here, but um, usually this will, will be enough for us, I think. And I also made a plan of uh, what I want to cover in those books. So the goal is uh, ST is Silverman Tate. There we will do probably chapter one. 
um, but only the part with elliptic curves. We will do, so this is only the rough sketch. Only two without elliptic curves over C. Chapter three. Um, maybe without some parts of the proof, because this chapter is basically the proof of the model theorem. And without section six and seven. So this is kind of what I definitely want to do. And then let's say optional because I will choose, yeah, depending on uh, how we proceed and uh, how, how things seem interesting to you. Uh, then we will maybe do some elliptic curves over finite fields. So this is all elliptic curves over rational fields. This is like chapter four in Silverman Tate or chapter five in Silverman. And if we do this, then we can maybe also talk about um, recent research Because I always find it very interesting if you uh, have a lecture and then you see, yeah, okay, what are people actually doing with this nowadays in research? So we can talk about something there. Um, another topic could be integral points on elliptic curves. which is um, chapter five in Silverman Tate and chapter nine in Silverman. And this is, um, this goes much, so, so this is maybe more like, we will talk about Galois representations there, which we will um, treat then. And this is more um, diophantine equations, so we have, polynomials with integer solutions and we have maybe some diophantine approximation where we want to find um, rational numbers that approximate uh, algebraic numbers or transcendental numbers. And, um, but if we do this, we probably leave out some of the diophantine background and only use the theorems as a black box because this could be basically a whole single lecture the whole, for a whole year or a whole semester. <coughs> and what else could be interesting? Elliptic curves and algorithms, which would be chapter 11 in Silverman. This is like um, something like uh, factorizing numbers with the help of elliptic curves, uh, computing the rank of elliptic curves, um, finding points, finding rational points, or cryptography with elliptic curves. Yeah, but we will first do this, and I think this will uh, keep us busy at least until Christmas. And then we can decide together what we, how we want to proceed. Okay, do you have questions concerning all this? Okay.
<coughs> okay, I have to sometimes look if it's still online and the microphone bars are moving, but everything seems fine. Okay, so So let's talk about elliptic curves. What is an elliptic curve? Since we want to work hands-on, I will start with this definition of an elliptic curve. This is, of course, not a definition of an elliptic curve, but we want to um, first get a feeling of what we are talking about. There's no colored chalk here. OK. This is very sad. Oh, yes, this would be great. Because for this part, it's basically essential to have colored chalk. OK, so this is an elliptic curve. This is also an elliptic curve. This is not an elliptic curve. And this is also not an elliptic curve. So actually, in both books, or at least in the in the book uh, of Silverman without Tate, they all also describe um, a theory where we can also treat those types of curves, oh, danke schön, as um, elliptic curves or something close to an elliptic curve. But for us, these are not elliptic curves. So what what is the nice thing about elliptic curves, why can't we just uh, look at um, parabolas or hyperbolics or something else? The nice thing is that we can actually geometric geometrically add points. Um, so let me find good points. We take P and Q here, and we want to add points on them. So they have some coordinates something comma something something comma something but it's not interesting to us we, we also have no numbers here we just have this drawing so what do we do we draw a line through p and q and now comes the first black box that we use algebraic geometry is wonderful but it's a big machine that can tell us things, but we don't need to understand how that machine works. So algebraic geometry magic tells us that there is always one, exactly one, third point that intersects this line and the curve. It's not as interesting to us why or how we could prove this. We only need that it is the case. So what do we do with this point? This is not yet our the sum of the two points. We still want to reflect it by the x-axis and get this point here. And this will be p plus q. We can also do this here. For example, let's take this and this point, p and q, draw a line. Yeah. Get the third intersection point, reflect it here, and this is p plus q. 
We can also add a point to itself. And then now I have to choose a good point. Let's take R here, this R. And we want to add R and R. So what do we have to do? We have to draw a line through R and R. And this is, of course, the tangent. Because it, it, should, it should intersect the curve in exactly two points at R. So this is the tangent because it has multiplicity 2 here. And we draw this line. And again, get a third point of intersection and reflect it here. And this is 2 times r. OK, let's take this point, r, and add it to itself. Again, we take the tangent. Oh, so there is no third intersection point that we can see. Here again, we need algebraic geometry magic, which is not that much magic. So we will later on, when we actually define what an elliptic curve is, we can read of the equation and the definition that there is a third intersection point, namely the point at infinity. So we just have to imagine that infinitely far away from the origin, there is just a place called infinity, place not in the sense of um, valuation, just uh, uh, like a geographical place. And there's a place called infinity, and this is there no matter in what direction you go, and it's the same point no matter what direction you go. So if you go from here to infinity, you will reach the same point as if you go from here to infinity. So there is exactly one third intersection point, namely the point at infinity, which is basically you can um, imagine as if you would take the board and make a ball out of it. And then the north pole of this ball is the point at infinity. This is actually really what algebraic geometrists do they take a plane thing and make it into a ball, and then uh, the North Pole is the point at infinity. And then they can actually work with it. But we just have to imagine that there is um, the third point. So um, the third point of intersection is the point at infinity. We mirror it by the x-axis and get the same point again. So 2 times r is the point at infinity, and we call it O. Curly O. Yeah? Wouldn't every other um, intersection of points also uh, intersect infinity so that there are then four points? <laughs> yes, but they would intersect, they wouldn't intersect the curve again at infinity. Um, this is now again the background that we that I'm not sure that we will treat. So later on, we will define an elliptic curve by equations. And then we can look at homogeneous equations and inhomogeneous equations. And the homogeneous equations, they have the point at infinity. And we can, and then we uh, take the inhomogeneous equation and work with that. But instead, we could just also work with the homogeneous equation and then also see that those um, lines don't intersect the curve at infinity again um, because the, the homogeneous equations do not match there. Yeah. So now we can look at those two curves which are not elliptic curves. Here we could also, of course, take two points and get this point and mirror it here, and we would basically have also a nice group structure, except for this point here. So if we take this point, let's call it S, and we want to add it to itself, yeah, which tangent should we take? We can take all the tangents we want, because there are infinitely many. 
So this is bad. That's why we don't want elliptic curves like this. And the same is here. When we want to add this point to itself, there are two tangents that we could choose. So it's not well defined what S plus S would be. So this is also bad. And we don't want to call these types of curves elliptic curves. And the equation that we will define later can basically have those four types of uh, graphical, um, uh, uh, how, th how they can look, because it's either just one part or two parts, or it's singular, and then we just want, don't want to look at it. Um, we will also learn what um, arithmetic and algebraic differences it brings when we have this type or this type, but actually the difference is not that big. It's just some um, small structural thing that will not be that important. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Good. Um, so we, we saw that we can add points. Then there, there are some natural questions that arise. One natural question would be, is there always an inverse of a point? For example, if we take this point, what point do we need to choose such that S plus the other point is the point at infinity? And it's actually quite nice that it's just this one. Because if we add those two points, uh, <laughs> we get a line that intersects the curve again at infinity. We mirror it, it's still infinity. So uh, the inverse of a point is always just its reflection by the x-axis. And this also works here, of course, if we take P, Q, R, S, T, and then minus T is just the same point, because then we have this line, which is again, has a third intersection point at infinity, so T plus T is the point at infinity, T, <laughs> yeah. So what other things could happen that we wish for. Um, one nice thing that's actually true, but I think we will not prove it at all, is associativity. If you want, you can take a large piece of paper and then get yourself uh, yeah um, uh, get yourself comfortable with the fact that it is true by just taking triples of points and uh, drawing the lines and seeing that this point plus this is the same as this point plus this but i think this is uh, you need a large piece of paper because otherwise it gets too messy and you need to choose the points <laughs> wisely so that the lines you can see them and um, so the reason why we won't prove this is you can either, later when we define the elliptic curves with equations, you can either work with those equations, and then I think it's like um, two pages of writing that proves this, or you can use really hard algebraic geometry like Riemann-Roch theorem and um, uh, uh, Schnitte, I don't know what the English word is, maybe intersections, and yeah, Schnitte, yeah, but there are some, so I don't know if intersection is the mathematical right word to, um, to and uh, divisors, and so this would fill another whole lecture, so we probably won't prove this. But you can um, look it up in one of the books later. I will, uh, I will talk about that later again when we actually define elliptic curves. 
So now we, yeah, we um, made ourselves um, familiar with elliptic curves. We haven't defined anything yet. But still, I think if I um, would draw some curves, you could probably tell me uh, if it's an elliptic curve or if it's not. And you could probably add points if I gave you an elliptic curve and a pen and <laughs> a ruler, maybe. So the goal of this lecture is basically um, doing things like this with also other topics of elliptic curves. I want to give you the intuition and the formal definitions, but I think the intuition is more important because the definitions, you get them in the books, and the intuition, you only get them by someone telling you and taking your hand and doing some exercises with you. So this, this is also the style of the lecture that, that awaits you. Um, and also, as I um, already kind of said here, um, the, the most of the things that we will do will be over Q, over the rational numbers. That sounds very easy, but it's of course not easy. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a master uh, course. Um, and the world of the elliptic curves is so big that um, we don't want to treat elliptic curves over any field. For example, here I said without E over C, because the world of elliptic curves over the complex numbers is a whole new world. So elliptic curves over the rational numbers is like um, algebraic number theory, number fields, and uh, ring of integers, um, units, and things like this. And elliptic curves over the complex numbers is more like modular forms, Eisenstein series. Um, an elliptic curve over the complex numbers is also actually a torus or a lattice. And what you see here is basically if you take a donut and you cut it, so this is basically elliptic curve over C, and if you cut it and kind of uh, take the north pole of the donut and glue it <laughs> into a ball, then basically you get the elliptic curve over Q. And so this is just a whole other theory. And we will not, uh, we will not do anything uh, with the complex numbers here, except for when we, can, for example, look at number fields that have some complex numbers in them. Um, yeah, and maybe in the second part, we will also uh, talk about finite fields. Uh, so finite fields, basically FP and maybe something like a power there, but basically FP. So this is a field like this. And this also seems as it would be pretty easy because it's only a finite field. What can what can happen there? Nothing because it's only finite. No, it's uh, very complicated and uh, also very interesting. And there's also a big connection between um, if you take the elliptic curve over the rational numbers first and then transform it into an elliptic curve over some FP. So you take just compute modulo some p. Question is, when can you do that? that? Can you always do that? No. And uh, what happens? And um, what happens depending on which p you take? Uh, I'm not sure how far we will, we will come there. Yeah. Ah, so in my calculation, the first hour would be over by, by now, but um, uh, it's not, which is probably good. <laughs> Other questions until now? What? Ah, because otherwise uh, um, we will not we will not we will not get a nice group structure out of it. 
for example, um, uh, then uh, adding, yeah, yeah, we, we need it in order so that in order to get a, um, a neutral element. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the black box answer, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now we start with actual definitions and actual theory. Um, let me see. Uh, So we start now with the actual definition of the elliptic curves. Mm. Maybe I will um, give two definitions of elliptic curves. Um, once the definition where we define it by the homogeneous polynomial that basically can be used to use more of the algebraic geometry background. And then later we will also use a kind of short definition um, that we will use to actually work with it. And I will just write, um, always write in which book and on which page everything is. So you can look it up. So, mm, I will divide this maybe in two. Um, And for the algebraic geometry part, we need this. Oh, I don't know if it's the word, right word, smooth. But this is only, yeah, well, for kind of a bit more background, the definition that we will actually use later will be another one. Of course, you can, you can copy everything down, but I think you don't need to copy that much, but you can you can decide because I I when I listen to talks or to lectures, um, and I 
copy whatever is on the board, I cannot concentrate. But if you can do that, just um, do as you like. Um, so this equation looks nasty and wild. Uh, and I cannot explain why there is no A5. It's just the way that people um, numerate those A's. I don't know why. And we, so, so this is the point where we start with this equation. The elliptic curve is then um, all the sets of points x, y, z, which fulfill this equation together with a point at infinity. And now comes what I said, that we can see it a bit from this, um, uh, from this curve, and that we could also use this to see which tangents or which lines intersect the point, uh, the, the curve at infinity, because now when we um, take the point um, when we take this point, whoops, so if we take x equal to 0, this will be 0, this, 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 y equal to 1, um, and z equal to 0, then the equation will be 0 on the left side, 0 on the right side, without all the points being 0. So the magic in algebraic geometry is that we have one more variable instead of like as we would know it from school to describe such a curve we actually only need x and y but to make it possible to also look at infinity we take another variable and just forbid that all three variables are zero at the same time and then kind of we go backwards again take the point at infinity that we um, got by uh, adding that extra variable. And then we can actually forget again that there's this homogeneous equation. So after finding that we have this point at infinity, and after knowing that whenever we need to work with it, we just go back to our homogeneous equation, after that, we can just forget that homogeneous equations exist. No, let me say after getting a point So after getting our point at infinity, we can go back to homogeneous equations and get the better definition. And actually later we will get an even more, e an e even, even easier definition. Um, but in between, Is it saying I should stop? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, your question? Um, yeah, is there you know, like a, a simple conceptual reason why there is no x cubed y uh, nor uh, x, y cubed, uh, x, y squared term? Oh, simple, probably not. So this is... Um, 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 yeah, if, if we had another um, way of, uh, if we had the terms that we don't have here, then it just would not be a nice curve we where we can add points anymore. So, yeah? Is 
Ah, you mean that we can, um, if we had that, we could just um, get rid of it? Ah, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But a, a, a similar thing we will do now with the, with the not homogeneous equation. So maybe that will answer your question. But um, if we hadn't started with that homogeneous equation, oh, inhomogeneous, I mean here. Uh, um, if we hadn't started with a homogeneous equation, but um, already with something only with x and y, we would also have um, not have all the terms that could exist. Um, um, but in some way, many that can exist. So let me just, I will write that definition here and then we will take a break. Um, which is the one? Or, or let's, let's have this definition after the break. And now we have a break of 15 minutes and we start again at 11.17.